September 2018, Bill Cosby is sentenced to 3 to 10 years in prison. Until he wasn't. <laughs> February 2020, Harvey Weinstein gets 23 years in the pen. August 2021, Kevin Spacey is. What the hell is going on with Kevin Spacey? Even after being accused by dozens of men for sexual assault, it isn't apparent where Kevin Spacey is, what all these accusations have amounted to. And even though many ruthless, powerful men would rather have me not talk about Kevin Spacey's preference for grabbing young men in the balls, I'm going to anyway in this mental episode of... So in an effort to find out what's going on with Kevin Spacey, we should start our search where the accusations all began on October 29, 2017. Where actor Anthony Rapp, who you might know from his roles in Star Trek Discovery, A Beautiful Mind, or in the musical Rent if you're one of those weirdos who actually likes watching musicals, accused Kevin Spacey of making a sexual advance towards him 30 years prior, when he was only 14 and Spacey was 26. Anthony started his acting career at the early age of 9, and by the time that he was 14, starred alongside Ed Harris in the Broadway play Precious Sons. And if you're like me and get both of these actors' names confused, just remember that Ed Harris is the one who doesn't have hair. Spacey was also starring a Broadway play this time, Tall Long Day's Journey to Night, and met Anthony for the first time during a post show gathering, where cast members from different plays eat and mingle. After meeting Anthony at one or two more of these post show gatherings, Spacey invited the 14 year old to a party at his Manhattan apartment. An invitation that Anthony accepted is it was rather normal 1986 for child actors to socialize with their adult co stars. After showing up to the party, Anthony noticed that he was the only kid there and not knowing anyone other than Spacey, got bored and went to an upstairs bedroom to watch TV after binge watching 13 straight episodes of Cheers. Hey. Anthony saw Spacey leaning against the doorway in a manner that I'm sure Spacey thought would make him look like this, with Anthony realizing the party was over and that he and Spacey were the only ones left in the apartment. According to Anthony, Spacey picked him up like a groom picks up the bride over the threshold, and then laid down on top of him in a manner Anthony is sure was meant to be seductive. Interestingly, a similar series of events happened during the play Precious Sons, in which Ed Harris's character drunkly mistakes his son, played by Rap, for someone else, climbs on top of him, and makes a sexual advance. And considering that everyone is smiling in this picture, this the scene where Ed Harris tries to have sex with his 14 year old son must be a real side splitter. <laughs> and just as how Anthony was sure that Spacey picking him up and laying down on top of him was meant to be seductive, knowing how much of an artsy fartsy Spacey is, I'm sure it was meant to be a reference to Anthony's play as well. Anthony managed to flee into a nearby bathroom, and after gathering his thoughts, told Spacey, okay, I'm going to go home now, with Spacey fortunately allowing him to leave. Anthony also pointed to an interview that he gave to The Advocate in 2001, where he described the same exact encounter 16 years prior, but without Spacey's name, saying that he and the publicist removed it out of fear of public scrutiny, is Spacey using his immense influence to derail Anthony's career. Gotta call cap on that, bro. Yo, so what you saying? Is Anthony came out the same time as all these lying against my broski Harvey? Sounds like another sussy you want case based bank. <laughs> Straight cash, homie. Am I right, bro? No, you First of all, according to the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network, or RAIN, who are in no way named after Rain Wilson, only 31% of sexual assaults are reported to police. And of this 31%, most of them reported long after the sexual assault occurred. This, combined with the fact that most sexual assaults leave little evidence, with the little evidence they do leave disintegrating after only a few days, explains why that for every 1,000 sexual assaults are reported, only 28 of them result in the abuser being convicted. There are multiple reasons why these sexual assaults are never reported to police or aren't reported until long after they occurred, including feelings of shame, as victims are oftentimes blamed for the sexual assault happening in the first place. And regardless of how little they were wearing or how much they were asking for it, sexual assault is never the victim's fault. Now, I'm not denying that victims oftentimes put themselves in bad positions to be sexually assaulted, but to say they were asking for it isn't the power move that some people think it is. Unless, of course, they are trying to justify sexual assault in certain situations, in which case they are pieces of because sexual assault is never justified. Some other common reasons include fear of retaliation from the abuser or others, and the belief that police can't or won't do anything to help them. The reason that Anthony told the story in October 2017 rather than 30 years prior was due to the dozens of women that were coming out to tell their story of being sexually assaulted by Harvey Weinstein during the same moment in time. They not only empowered Anthony to tell his story, but compelled him to tell his story as well. This period of time is often known as the beginning of the Me Too movements. It might come as a surprise to some of you hearing me say that not so long ago. I believe that the Me Too movement and everyone in it was full of I was convinced that most of the accusers were crazy 
who made up their stories of sexual assault for an easy payday, and to tear down men who are more successful than them out of jealousy. Or to put it another way, I used to think that the Me Too movement wasn't far from something like this. The age of men is over. I also thought it was really convenient how all these accusers would come out of the woodwork simultaneously to accuse the same man with the same crime, as if they all wanted a slice of that monetary pie. But after having done some research, having expanded my horizons, and having grown the f up a little bit, I came to realize that my assumptions of the Me Too movement were totally wrong. The first place where I realized I was wrong was my belief that many of the accusers were making everything up because although false sexual assault accusations are made from time to time, it wasn't nearly as often as I assumed. This is because according to the National Sexual Violence Resource Center, a review of research finds that the prevalence of false reporting in sexual assault cases is between 2% and 10%, meaning that sexual assault accusers are telling the truth at the very least 90% of the time, and upwards of 98% of the time. Now before any of you sexually frustrated Redditors out there can comment INNOCENT UNTIL PROVEN GUILTY This by no means disposes of due process because even though accusers of sexual assault are almost always telling the truth the validity of their accusations need to be judged separately and ruled on accordingly One reason why many people believe false accusations are much more prevalent than they really are is because in the rare occurrence in which a sexual assault accuser does lie, it receives much more media coverage than the countless other instances where a sexual assault accuser tells the truth, as stories revolving around accusers lying sell much better on average than stories accusers telling the truth. Just another instance of the mainstream media not giving a f about anything but money. And even though accusers are telling the truth between 90 and 98% of the time, based on the sheer number of women who accuse Harvey Weinstein of sexual assault, it's very likely that at least one of them was lying. But the notion that all or even most of them were lying is complete and utter bullshit. Loose lips sink ships. The bigger the lie, the more people want to spill the beans on it. And the more people who know about the lie, the more people there are to spill the beans on it. Now that's a lot of beans. So with this in mind, what are the odds that that many women, who know that big of a lie, could keep it a secret for that long? And to address the phenomenon of accusers coming out of the woodworks at the same time, it's easier for accusers to make their accusations together rather than separately. The reason being is that the burden of accusing someone of sexual assault, which includes being hounded by the media and by those who don't believe them, who oftentimes are the same people, is spread across multiple accusers instead of just one. And even though courage is contagious and the first step is always the hardest to take are both corny cliches, they're very applicable here. As the first accusation is always the hardest to make, and the courage that comes from that first accuser spreads to the others like a bad case of COVID. Yeah, I made a COVID joke. They what, want to fight about it? Anyways, back to Anthony and Spacey. Considering the nature of Anthony's accusations and the star power Spacey's name had, it didn't take long for the accusations to receive extensive media coverage. Feeling the pressure to respond, Spacey released this statement on Twitter and Instagram later that same day. In it, Spacey claims that he honestly does not remember the encounter, as it would have been over 30 years ago, but that if he did behave the way Anthony described, they owes him the sincerest apology for what would have been deeply inappropriate drunken behavior. And figuring that he was in need of some sympathy points, publicly came out for the first time in his life, stating that I choose now to live as a gay man. A great plan by Kevin Spacey, right boys? Not a great plan. This is because other than the troubling correlation that Spacey's statement inherently made between homosexuality and pedophilia, it was apparent to many people that Spacey was trying to make the narrative about him coming out rather than Anthony accusing him of sexual assault. One of the people that called Spacey out on this was Zachary Quinto, who most famously plays Spock in the new Star Trek movies alongside excessive lens flare, in which he said that it is deeply sad and troubling that this is how Kevin Spacey has chosen to come out. Not by standing up as a point of pride, but as a calculated manipulation to deflect attention from the very serious accusation that he attempted to molest a member of the LGBTQ community. And what Anthony says is true and Spacey did make a sexual advance towards him when he was only 14 and Spacey was 26, it's totally reprehensible behavior that deserves punishment regardless of what happened 30 years prior. And punishment was served because after six more men accused Spacey of sexual assault in the following days, Netflix announced that they would axe the disgraced actor from season 6 of House of Cards, and that a biopic starring Spacey would never see the light of day. Since many of House of Cards season 6 scenes and the entire biopic had already been filmed, Netflix lost $39 million after making the decision to cut ties with Spacey. Spacey was also removed from the Ridley Scott film All the Money in the World, and was replaced by Christopher Plummer, who received an Oscar nomination in Spacey's place, which was a casting change that cost over $10 million since Spacey's scenes had already been filmed. Considering the House of Cards was Netflix's flagship show at the time, and that $39 million and $10 million respectively is a lot of money unless you're Bill Gates, or his wife now I think about it. Some of you might be thinking that removing Kevin Spacey over six accusations, no matter how egregious they might have been, was a pretty rash decision. And if you find yourself in this train of thoughts. Don't touch that dial now, we're just getting started. 
because after breaking down some of the more noteworthy cases against Spacey, you'll see that he more likely not committed most, if not all the accusations placed against him. So without further ado, let's start with this case. In September 2018, 11 months after his initial fall from grace, Spacey was accused of sexual assault by a massage therapist. According to Blast, which has the most homoerotic title slogan combination ever and you want it, we got it! The massage therapist, who remained anonymous under the pseudonym John Doe, Say in his suit that during a massage session with Spacey in October 2016, Spacey grabbed John Doe's hand and pulled into his scrotum and testicles. The therapist says he tried giving Spacey the benefit of the doubt and continuing the massage, but to no avail. As Spacey then forced John Doe's hand to rub his penis, scrotum, and testicles the second time, the massage therapist stepped back from the table, with Spacey standing up and exposing his naked body, and grabbing his shoulders in an attempt to kiss him, which sounds an awful lot like the Room 237 scene from The Shining. <laughs> Rejecting his advances, the massage therapist claims that Spacey then grabbed his genitals and offered to perform oral sex on him. The therapist was eventually able to grab his massage table and leave without further instance. Other than some initial objection from Spacey's attorney that the massage therapist shouldn't be protected with anonymity, the lawsuit was moving through the courts well, and a final pretrial conference was scheduled for May 2020. That is until September 18, 2019, when it was announced that the suit would be dismissed as the massage therapist unexpectedly died. In a statement made by John Doe's attorney, they said that his untimely death was, to his family, a devastating shock that they were struggling to process, and it's so recent that they have not yet held his funeral service. And considering that the massage therapist was the sole witness of this alleged assault, the court had no choice but to dismiss the case. So chalk up one case that Kevin Spacey was able to weasel himself out of. Backtracking a little bit, in November 2017, Spacey was accused of groping an 18-year-old in Nantucket Bar the year prior in June of 2016. According to the Associated Press, the 18-year-old who was a busboy at the club car in Nantucket, and who remained anonymous during the entire proceedings, told police he wanted to get a picture with Spacey, and went over to talk to him after his shift ended. Spacey bought the busboy several drinks, and tried to persuade him to come home with him, before unzipping the busboy's pants and groping him for about three minutes. The busboy tried to move Spacey's hand the groping continued, and he didn't make a scene because he didn't want to get in trouble for drinking. Despite only being 18, the busboy told Spacey that he was 23, which was the first of many stupid decisions made during this case, all of which will be on full display in a few moments. Also worth noting is that Spacey reportedly bought the busboy 4 or 5 beers and then 4 or 5 glasses of whiskey, leaving him completely faced. While Spacey sexually assaulted the young man, the busboy texted his girlfriend, telling her about the assault as it was happening. To dispel his girlfriend's initial belief, the busboy told police he sent her a Snapchat video of Spacey groping him. The Snapchat video the busboy sent to his girlfriend was not available online, but according to reporters of the Boston Globe, the video is very brief, it's only about a second long, showing someone's hand touching a person's shirt, but not touching them in any way that was inappropriate. So unless Kevin Spacey was wearing that high class ring his character Frank Underwood wears in House of Cards, it could have been anyone's liver spotted hands touching the busboy's shirt. Who knows, those liver spotted hands could have belonged to Joe Biden, the current president of the United States. Oh, who am I kidding? Biden likes young girls, not young boys. And on second thought, 18 is way too old for him. And I've loved kids jumping on my lap. Not like Trump is any better though. When you're a star, they let you do it. You can do anything. <laughs> Whatever you want. Grab him by the pussy. <laughs> I can do anything. When police recovered the bar surveillance footage, they discovered that where the assault was reported to have occurred was out of the camera's view. And even though the screenshots of the busboy provided police of the conversation with his girlfriend weren't available online either, I did find a transcript of their conversation and recreated the screenshots with a fake text generator. I'll give you a moment to read the text yourself before discussing them further. So other than the fact that the busboy is one of those annoying ass spam texters, and that his girlfriend seems really jealous that Kevin Spacey is flirting with him, I think we can agree that this is a pretty strange situation no matter how you slice it. It's weird that a 56 year old man in Spacey is grabbing an 18 year old's dick in public. It's weird that the busboy was able to text his girlfriend while all this was going on. And it's weird that he allowed Spacey to grope him for about 3 minutes, despite knowing that he was really drunk and that he didn't want to get in trouble for drinking. But the thing that's perhaps even weirder than all this is the belief that people should act reasonable when something very unreasonable like sexual assault is happening to them. And if they don't, that their accusations become less credible because it's a sign that they were trying to exploit the situation or that it didn't bother them. And for those of you who feel this way about the busboy situation despite everything that's been laid out, all that I have to say is... It doesn't matter what you think! <laughs> Again, all these are just accusations, and as long as there aren't any felonies committed, like, I don't know, tampering of evidence, this case can reach a swift and just ruling. Son of a b 
Well, as you saw by the headline, this case got very messy very quickly. The species' attorneys accused the busboy of deleting text messages from his phone. The reason for this is that the text messages found in the data extraction conducted by the court did not match the screenshots that the busboy gave to police. In particular, the tail end of the busboy's conversation with his girlfriend went from this in the screenshots to something like this in the data extraction. Needless to say, the removal of these text messages drastically changed the entire mood of the encounter. From the busboy wanting a picture with Spacey and viewing the ordeal as a hell of a story to tell, to the busboy getting sexually assaulted against his will. So we know from the data extraction that text messages were deleted from the phone. The only question is, who deleted them? Well, it turns out the busboy's mother deleted the messages herself, as he or she is admitting to the act in court. How many messages, photographs, Snapchats, videos, whatever, did you delete from the phone before Not handing- Not a lot before handing it over to Trooper Donovan? Not many. There were just a couple of things that concerned me. The things that concerned mommy included evidence of the busboy cheating in college classes, using marijuana and cocaine. Jesus f***ing Christ. Cocaine is a hell of a drug. <laughs> False identification cards, and photos of naked girls that were soon were taken by the busboy as friends. You know, stupid frat boy bullshit. So the busboy's mother deleted the text messages in part to make her son's case against Spacey stronger, and in part because she wanted to save herself from the embarrassment that her son's stupid fat boy activities would bring. While the busboy was on the stand, Spacey's attorney pulled a little Una reverse card on his ass by asking him if he knew that tampering of evidence was a felony, causing him to plead the fifth, which in turn caused his testimony to be stricken from the record. Considering that the busboy was the sole witness to the crime, and that he could no longer testify since he evoked his Fifth Amendment right to not self-incriminate, the case fell apart quickly and was dismissed a week later. Despite this case being full of inconsistencies and lies, including the busboy telling Spacey that he was old enough to drink when he wasn't, and his mother deleting the text messages, it doesn't change the fact that Spacey more likely not sexually assaulted the young man, and got away with it scot-free. Nearly every case of sexual assault involves a power imbalance of some kind, with this case in particular being rampant with power imbalances. Some common power imbalances that are seen in sexual assault cases include professional, like the power imbalance between a boss and one of their employees, personal, such as a parent and a child, societal, which includes the leverage famous people have over unfamous people, financial, because as they say, money is power, and at its most rawest form physical, like the strength advantage that a man oftentimes but not always possesses over a woman. Another common power balance is intellectual, meaning how much life experiences and knowledge of the world a person has, which although has a lot of factors, is directly correlated with the person's age, with an older person in general having more life experiences and knowledge than a younger person. Or in other words, age is a power imbalance. And despite this knowledge oftentimes being used for good, such as an older teacher passing their knowledge down to younger students, it also can be used for bad, unfortunately. And this is exactly what Kevin Spacey did with the busboy, as he used his life experiences and knowledge of the world to trick a younger, more naive person into allowing him to sexually assault them. I'm not saying that the busboy was more naive than Spacey is a way to call him stupid. Rather, I am saying that he was more naive because he was an 18-year-old barely out of high school, while Spacey was a grown-ass man at 56. When you're 18, you think you know the world a lot better than you actually Actually do, and not until you're older can you realize how little you actually knew when you were 18. This is exactly why, although a relationship between an 18 year old and a 40 year old might be legal, it's not moral, as the older person in such a relationship possesses a tremendous power imbalance over the younger person because to stress it again, age is a power imbalance. It's also just weird and creepy. Some other power balances that were definitely in play in this case were societal, because if Kevin Spacey wasn't the world famous actor that he was, the busboy wouldn't even been talking to Spacey, let alone in a position to be sexually assaulted by him. And finally, financial, because when the busboy did try to charge Spacey with sexual assault, Spacey used his immense wealth to buy the best lawyers that money could buy to defend him. It doesn't help that the busboy and his mom totally botched the case, but hey, my point stands. Toronto Burke, who started using the phrase Me Too in 2006, and is considered the founder of the Me Too movement, perfectly sums up the prevalence of these power imbalances in sexual assault cases by saying, Sexual violence is about power and privilege. That doesn't change if the perpetrator is your favorite actress, activist, or professor of any gender. And with this case and the one against the massage therapist, this marks the second time that Spacey was able to wiggle himself out of a precarious predicament. Even though we can't be certain if Spacey did or did not sexually assault the massage therapist and or the Nantucket busboy, President alone would suggest that he very likely assaulted both of them, despite there being a lot of reasons why somebody might make a false accusation of sexual assault, including media attention, a payday, or revenge. Sexual assault accusers deserve the benefit of the doubt that they're telling the truth, because as the NRVRC's findings would suggest, they're telling the truth between 90 and 98% of the time. 
Along with the fact that accusers of sexual assault are almost always telling the truth, another factor that makes it more likely than not that Kevin Spacey did sexually assault the busboy is that it's very unlikely that the busboy knew any of the rumors revolving around Spacey's sexuality, despite having a relationship with multiple women, including his pay it forward co star Helen Hunt. Do you know what my favorite Helen Hunt movie is? Oh! Twister! <laughs> People have been speculating and in some cases joking about Spacey's sexuality for decades. This includes a 1997 Esquire article titled Kevin Spacey Has His Secrets, and this joke made by Spacey himself while hosting the Tony Awards in 2017. I'm coming out. No, wait, no. Considering that the Nantucket busboy was born a year after the Esquire article was published, he would rather participate in stupid fat boy activities than watch the Tony Awards. What are the odds that he knew the rumors that Kevin Spacey was gay, so that he can in turn, make up such a specific allegation against him? As a film buff who had seen a dozen movies starring Kevin Spacey, from Seven, The Usual Suspects, American Beauty, all ways of the horrible Fred Claus. I mean, just look at that award-winning CGI. I can attest to the fact that I had not heard the rumors that Kevin Spacey was gay prior to Anthony's accusation against him, which is when the busboy sent those texts in the first place. And if someone like me hadn't heard the rumors that Kevin Spacey was gay, it's doubtful that the busboy had heard the rumors himself. By the way, here's a scene from Fred Claus featuring Spacey that didn't age well. I don't know what it is that you're into, but there's something real kind of creepy about you. And all I know is ever since you got here, my brother's been getting a little bit nervous and acting a little jumpy. That's wonderful. Tying all of this back into the accusations that the massage therapist made, which among other things, accused Kevin Spacey of grabbing his genitals. The busboy's accusations corroborated with those made by the massage therapist, and legitimacy to both of their claims. This is because of modus operandi is recognized. Latin for mode of operation, modus operandi is a pattern of criminal behavior so distinct that separate crimes are recognized as the same work of the same person. This includes Ted Bundy's preference of luring young girls by pretending to be injured while trying to put a heavy package in his car, and Kevin Spacey's preference of luring young men with his fame and prestige to grab them by their packages. Now it'd be foolish of me to not acknowledge the possibility that the massage therapist just copied the busboy story for this very reason. But remembering that sexual assault accusers are almost always telling the truth, it's much more likely that his accusations were truthful. So despite all the reasons the massage therapist might have had to lie, including fame, fortune, and revenge, he deserves the benefit of the doubt that he was telling the truth. This finding gets even more support when considering that most of the dozens of sexual assault accusations made against Spacey involved crotch grabbing of some kind. One of the more noteworthy of these accusations was made in December 2017 by Ari Ben, Norwegian author and husband of Norway's Princess Martha Louise. During the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize concert, which took place in Norway as co-hosted by Kevin Spacey and Uma Thurman, Ari, who was seated beside Spacey, says that Spacey put his hand under the table and grabbed him by the balls. In a tragic series of events, Ari ended up committing suicide on Christmas Day in 2019. One day after Kevin Spacey uploaded a bizarre YouTube video titled KDWK, which is short for Kill them with kindness. Ari's untimely death, along with the unexpected death of the massage therapist and a third Kevin Spacey accuser, sparked a whirlwind of conspiracy theories that Spacey was killing those accusing him of sexual assault. It's a bash crazy topic that I cover in depth in the video that I released alongside this one titled Did Kevin Spacey Really Kill Three of His Accusers? If you'd like to start watching that video now, you can do so by clicking the link right here. I'll also have the link to the video in the description below and at the end of this video. And speaking of Spacey's bizarre YouTube videos, Spacey has released three of them over the last three years, all of them on Christmas Eve, with the Killed and With Kindness video being the second of the bunch. The first video, titled Let Me Be Frank, was released on Christmas Eve 2018, the same day that Nantucket Busboy officially charged Spacey with sexual assault and features Spacey depicted in his House of Cards character Frank Underwood, who in case you haven't seen the show, is a sociopathic politician who doesn't mind getting some blood on his hands to get what he wants. Or in other words, a normal politician. Despite being in character during the whole video, many people took Spacey's words as denial of the real-life accusations placed against him, as much of what he says blurs the line between fiction and reality. Here's just one example of what is fact and what is fiction becoming uncertain during the video. Of course, some believed everything and had just been waiting with bated breath to hear me confess it all. They're just dying to have me declare that everything said is true and that I got what I deserved. Wouldn't that be easy? If it was all so simple. But you wouldn't believe the worst without evidence, would you? You wouldn't rush to judgments without facts, would you? Did you? So other than that Christmas apron being the cherry on top of this nutcase Sunday, I think we can agree that this video is pretty unsettling, regardless of whether or not you even know what's going on. It's also apparent why people would interpret this video as Spacey denying the real-life accusations made against him, despite remaining in character the entire time. And here's more of Spacey being a big old creeper during this gem of a video. Because I can promise you this. 
If I didn't pay the price for the things we both know I did do, I'm certainly not going to pay the price for the things I didn't do. Oh, of course, they're going to say I'm being disrespectful, not playing by the rules, like I ever played by anyone's rules before. I never did, and you loved it. Man, Spacey thinks he's really untouchable, doesn't he? The man probably thinks he can get away with murder. And since it would be criminal of me not to show the ending of this video, here it is in its full glory. Conclusions can be so deceiving. Miss me? And even though I screw around a lot, believe me when I say that I did not add the dramatic music at the end myself. That's, that's literally how the video ends. And after seeing a video like this, you have to wonder, why did Spacey make this creepy ass video? Why didn't he just deny the accusations like a normal sane person? Well, if there's one thing that I've learned about Kevin Spacey after spending the last two months researching him and making these videos, is that he's really one for theatrics. This is because one month after his case with the Nantucket busboy was dropped, Spacey did a public reading in Rome of a poem titled The Boxer, which was written after a bronze statue and among other things. It talks about a man fighting back from adversity. I wonder what it was about this statue that drew Kevin Spacey. Oh, okay, now I know. So now that we have all the necessary context laid out, we can now answer the question of what the hell's going on with Kevin Spacey. Well, as the making of this video, Kevin Spacey, a once disgraced actor who was essentially blacklisted from Hollywood, is slowly making his way back to acting, and he's yet to be charged or held liable for any of the crimes he more likely had not committed. Having said that, Spacey's not completely off the hook, fortunately, as Anthony Rapp filed a lawsuit against him in September 2020. Keep in mind that Anthony has taken Spacey to civil court, which is different from criminal court and that it is much easier to charge someone with an offense in civil court than it is in criminal court. This is because in civil court, in order to convict someone of an offense, the preponderance of the evidence standard must be satisfied, which means that the person more likely not committed the offense, or at least a 51% chance, while in criminal court, the beyond a reasonable doubt standard must be satisfied, which to give a rough percentage, means that there is at least a 95% chance the person committed the offense. The reason for this is that punishment Punishments for civil offenses only include fines, whereas punishments for criminal offenses can include fines, prison time, and even execution for capital offenses like murder. Considering that Anthony didn't file his lawsuit until September 2020, almost three years after his initial accusation, you might be wondering, why did Anthony wait to sue Spacey? Why didn't he just sue him when making his initial accusation? Well, this is because New York's old statute of limitations for child sexual abuse that was enforced when Anthony made his initial accusations in 2017 didn't allow Anthony to charge Spacey with child sexual abuse even if he wanted to. According to the New York Times, the Child Victims Act, which was adopted the prior year in 2019, significantly extended New York's statute statute limitations for childhood sex abuse. The old statute required that criminal and civil charges be brought before the survivor's 23rd birthday, where under the new law, victims can sue until age 55. Anthony was 46 when he made his initial accusations against Spacey, so he was not covered by the old statute of limitations, which required that criminal or civil charges be brought before the survivor's 23rd birthday. Now that Anthony is 49, and that the new and improved statute of limitations allow victims to sue until age 55, he can now sue the little rat bastard Spacey for all he's worth. With that said, the Child Protection Act has one stupid flaw, unfortunately, because despite allowing plaintiffs to bring civil charges until they're 55, they must bring criminal charges before they turn 28. And considering that Anthony is 20 years older than that, he's not included in the statute of limitations for criminal charges. Despite there being a million words that I could use to describe the logic behind this choice, the only two that I need are f***ing stupid. If there is substantial evidence of a sexual assault occurring, whether it be charged as a criminal offense or a civil offense, then no statute of limitations should be placed on it. Remembering that it oftentimes takes many years for victims of sexual assault to face their demons and accuse their abusers, statute of limitations in sexual assault cases does nothing but protect abusers and hurt victims even more so than they already have. Anthony's lawsuit against Spacey is still in the process of being litigated, and barring any delays, should reach a ruling either later this year or next year. Although there is a good chance that this case will reach a settlement before it reaches a ruling, as many lawsuits are settled out of court. If the court does in fact make a ruling on this case, there is a very good chance that they will rule in favor of Anthony. This is because although there is no actual evidence that Spacey did sexually assault Anthony at that party in 1986, the fact that his accusations corroborates with the story that he told the advocate in 2001 adds significant credibility to his story. Another thing that grants credibility to Anthony's accusations 
allegations is the fact that so many people accuse Spacey of sexual assault. This includes Anthony himself, the massage therapist and Nantucket busboy Ari Ben, and about 20 other people that are yet to mention in this video for the sake of simplicity. Now even a cringy beta male bitch like me who paints his fingernails can admit that it'd be wishful thinking to believe that every single one of Spacey's accusers is telling the truth. But luckily for me, I'm a guy making a YouTube video and not a lawyer, so I don't have to prove a goddamn thing. And fortunately for him, Anthony doesn't have to prove any of the accusations made by Spacey's other accusers for their accusations to inherently add credibility to his own. Since it's taking place in the civil court, all Anthony has to do is convince the court that Spacey more likely not sexually assaulted him. And for all the reasons mentioned during this video, Spacey more likely not did sexually assault Anthony and that man had an apartment 35 years ago. Even though Anthony's lawsuit is the only case pending against Spacey at this moment in time, he is still under investigation for many other accusations of sexual assault most notably six that are reported to have taken place in the UK. According to the Daily Mail, these sexual assaults are alleged to have taken place during a 17 year span, with the earliest alleged to occur in 1996 and the latest in 2013. And unless you're doing a research paper or video essay like this one, I advise against visiting the Daily Mail's website as I found news inside my advertisements. Who do these people think they are? As you might have noticed when looking at this table, there are pretty big discrepancies between the dates these sexual assaults are reported to police and the dates they were alleged to occur, which is evident of the aforementioned trend that victims of sexual assault almost never report the crime directly after it happens. Also worth mentioning is that although most of these sexual assaults are reported to police after Anthony's initial accusation, one of them was reported nine years prior in November 2008, which strongly corroborates Anthony's accusations along with all the others against Spacey. Although it would be a good while before Anthony's case or any of the other cases against Spacey reach a ruling, at least we could take comfort in knowing that Spacey won't book any new movie roles in the meantime. Are you kidding me. Well, as you can see from that second conveniently placed headline, Spacey is slowly but surely slithering his way back to the movie industry. Because in May of 2021, Franco Nero, who most famously played the gunslinger Django before Jamie Foxx and Django Unchained, casted Spacey in his upcoming movie titled The Man Who Drew God. The movie was star Nero and co-star Spacey and according to The Guardian, Nero plays a man who could draw people by listening to their voices, despite not being able to see, and is wrongly accused of sexually abusing children, with Spacey playing a small role as a detective investigating the case. Hmm. It's pretty interesting that Spacey would choose this of all movies to start his comeback with. I wonder why. Other than the fact that Nero casting Spacey in his movie sets a dangerous precedent that could be the start of a snowball effect of Spacey making his way back into the film industry, it's apparent that Spacey is trying to send a not so subtle message by co-starring in a movie about a man being wrongfully accused of sexually abusing children. Of course, this would be a fitting choice by Spacey if he himself had been wrongfully accused of sexually abusing children, but considering the pure number of accusations against him and the corroboration that they share, I'm gonna echo the words made famous by Vince McMahon in saying, no chance in hell. Between Kevin Spacey booking a new role in Franco Nero's movie, and Bill Cosby being released from prison for downright ludicrous reasons, every passing day seems like all the time, effort, and sacrifices made by the victims of these sexual predators to cancel them for good will all be in vain. Now I'm sure some of you cringed a little when I used the term cancel, as cancel culture has garnered an unfavorable reputation over recent years to say the least. Now cancel culture isn't about digging to people's past and getting them canceled over rather insignificant things that can be excused by the fact they were younger and in turn less considered than they are now, simply because we don't like them and or are jealous of their success. But I could definitely see why it's earned that reputation. After all, if it hadn't, satire like this wouldn't work. But that's the thing with cancel culture. We create our own narratives. We don't follow logic or facts. We follow the herd. Hmm, I see. Honestly, to cancel someone, it doesn't even have to be something they did in the past. It could be something they did today or something we think that they might do tomorrow. Nowadays, we cancel people for no reason. <laughs> you can do absolutely nothing. We'll cancel you. Instead, what cancel culture is supposed to be is holding people accountable that have done really egregious things and have gone away with it. This can include bringing awareness to the predatorial ways, jeopardizing their main sources of revenue and power so they can no longer prey on people they have power over, and if the punishment fits the crime, putting them in prison. Although I can end this video by saying that Kevin Spacey is another product of the evil Hollywood machine that turns good people into monsters, I'm not going to. 
As I believe the nuance that for every Hollywood star that ends up becoming a sexual predator, they do so for a particular set of reasons that are unique to their own experiences. This train of thought seemed to ring true when I came across this interesting interview conducted by Inside Edition with Kevin Spacey's brother. Kevin Spacey's own brother is ripping into the embattled actor over that bizarre video he just posted. The man has no shame. He's begging for his job. Whoa, hold up. That is Kevin Spacey's brother? What in the Neverland Ranch? Rod Stewart is going on here. And in an effort to find out how this man could ever be related to Kevin Spacey, I discovered a possible explanation as to why Kevin Spacey ended up becoming the person that he is. According to Kevin's older brother Randy, their father, who along with being a Nazi supporter, physically and sexually abused both Kevin and himself when they were children. Despite taking the brunt of the abuse to spare his little brother from the trauma it can cause, in an interview given the day after Anthony's accusation was published, Randy said that he had only spoken to Kevin five times in the last 40 years, and not once in the last 14 years. And along with being completely estranged from Kevin, Randy says that both their father and their mother were victims of abuse, which he believes is the reason why their father was abusive in the first place, and why their mother didn't do anything to stop the abuse. This is something they hear quite often, the idea that people who are sexually abused as children are more likely to become perpetrators of child sexual abuse in the future. And even though it would be reckless to say that victims of child sexual abuse are destined to become perpetrators in the future, there is definitely some merit to it. Because according to Cycle of Child Sexual Abuse, links between being a victim and becoming a perpetrator. Perpetrators of child sexual abuse report to have been abused as children 35% of the time, while people who are not perpetrators report to have been abused 11% of the time. Or in other words, people who are sexually abused as children were three times more likely to sexually abuse children in the future than those who are not. Although the actions of 65% of perpetrators couldn't be explained by being victims of child sexual abuse, the researchers behind the study still found a very clear positive correlation between the two. As a result, we can't say for sure that Kevin ended up becoming a sexual predator because his father sexually abused him when he was a child, but there's a good chance it's the reason why he did. And even though child sexual abuse is one of the most heinous evils in the world, one that can steal the joy, empathy, trust, and motivation from one's life, it is no defense for the things that Kevin Spacey more likely than not did to Anthony Rapp, the Nantucket busboy, the massage therapist Ari Ben, or the dozens of other people who have accused him of sexual assault. This is because despite being burdened with heavy adversity from an early age, some victims of child sexual abuse have the fortitude to flip that adversity on top of its head to become wonderful individuals with thought-provoking and intelligent perspectives of the world. One of these wonderful individuals is Kevin's very own brother Randy, who despite looking like a total wacko on the outside, is one of the more reasonable, level-headed people you'll ever hear speak. For example, just listen to the way in which Randy deconstructs the main issue with Kevin's behavior and other Hollywood elites like him, the day after Anthony accused Kevin of sexual assault. Certain people People, they get money and fame and they think that they're above the law. They think they're above moral conduct for, uh, that a society will accept. They think they can get away with anything. And when they get away with it once, then they feel pretty confident they could do it again. It's funny that the guy who looks like a creep on the outside is totally normal on the inside, and that the guy who looks totally normal in comparison is actually the creep. A prime example of the saying, don't judge a book by its cover. And to end this video, here are some points that Randy made during his 30 minute interview that I believe can resonate with all of us. It's very difficult for people to stand naked before God and realize that all the mistakes that you made, you cannot blame on everyone else. You're eventually gonna to have to own them, eat them, digest them, and move them out. And if you can't, you're going to continue to do the same stuff over and over again. If my brother could just experience family, it would open up his eyes to a whole new world. At the end of the day, nobody cares that you're an actor. All that matters inside is your family and your friends and your relationships. If you, if you get rid of that, what are you? 